learned more about this wonderful facility that has been developed here in these programs and saw that we have here housed a collection of Barbara Holland's papers. I've had the honor of working with Dr. Holland at Western Carolina University. She came in to do a review of the program uh, for service learning on WCU's campus. So it truly is an honor and a privilege to be here. Before I uh, get started on our ambitious agenda today, I don't know what I was thinking when I decided to do benefits across four audiences. I, I, I must, have, must have had a glass of wine or something before when I, when I decided to take that approach. Before I do that, I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, in many ways, I'm a messenger today. I certainly have led and, and contributed to and collaborated uh, on much of the information that I'm sharing, but I certainly did not do what I'm reporting to you by myself. And so I want to give a shout out to just a few people that I work with very closely at Western Carolina University. The first one is Dr. Lane Perry who is the director of the Center for Service Learning at WCU. Does anybody know Lane in this room? He's uh, definitely uh, a nationally uh, recognized uh, scholar and practitioner in service learning. And I think probably Lane knows more about service learning. I'm sorry, Lane has forgotten more about service learning uh, than I may ever know. So he's a, a, a great colleague and a great expert. Mr. David Onder was the director of assessment when we submitted our sex, uh, successful <coughs> application, reapplication for reaffirmation, reaffirmation for the Carnegie Foundation for Teaching for the Community Engaged designation, which I know that UNO has as well. So suffice it to say, without David Onder and his data collection, those see people nodding their heads because they, they totally understand, without his skills and expertise, there would not have been an application. So, uh, so, so very important to recognize his good work, as well as Dr. Steve Haw, who is a professor of economics at Western. And uh, Steve and I have collaborated on a number of projects, uh, including several in Dillsboro. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those. And he also was uh, the research method statistical person for a public relations campaign service learning uh, research project that I'm going to talk about in just a few moments. So I, I thought it was really important to be transparent and to disclose my role in all of this, uh, particularly when we are in a political season. Uh, here's my dig, here it comes. When we have presidential candidates who are not doing the same. All right, so I've got that out of the way. Are, are we ready to get started? Wanna, wanna talk about uh, some uh, excellent community engagement, some research at Western Carolina University. All right, let's do it. So here is the plan. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about mutually beneficial relationships because I think that is the crux of community engagement. And I'm going to um, identify some of the benefits related to community engagement going to provide some examples of how we have measured those benefits. And the focus here on this measuring is going to be on outcomes or accomplishments, not just activities. And that's an important distinction. Measuring activities is important, but really we want to focus on the outcomes or the accomplishments. And so I have selected examples that meet that criteria. And then of course I'm a PR person, so I've got to highlight some of the successes. And that's really important for community engagement too. We want to share uh, the successes. We want to share these mutually uh, beneficial relationships. And so it's ambitious, this presentation, because I'm going to be trying to do this for four audiences. So I'm going to be looking at uh, community. We're going to be starting with the community because from my perspective, that's where your objectives and your strategy really should originate. You want your community to be true partners in that effort. We're going to talk just a little bit about the university, faculty, and students. I'm going to spend most of my time, about half the presentation time, focusing on community and specifically the Dillsboro, North Carolina community engagement project. So that's the plan. So I want to a plan. You ready? All right. Uh, this definition here comes from the Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation 
for the advancement of teaching. How many of you are familiar with the classification description? Okay, so several of you have seen this before. And I'm not going to spend time reading this to you, but you see in bold that we have highlighted this idea of mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge, so that transfer of knowledge from university to partners, and I might add back from, because I think community partners can be educators as well, so that exchange of knowledge and resources in that context of partnership and reciprocity. So reciprocity is a really important component, and you will see that uh, illustrated in some of the examples. And the second part of this definition is a really lofty goal, right? An incredibly lofty goal. It is an aspirational definition that we are doing this exchange of knowledge and resources and this partnership of reciprocity so that we can do these things, so that we're going to be able to enrich scholarships, so faculty scholarship, and we'll show you measures of that. Uh, to enhance curriculum, teaching and learning. And a lot of times that's what people really think about when you think about community engagement is the service learning. So what are the students learning and, and how are the faculty members using teaching in order to do that? And the end goal, preparing educated, engaged citizens, strengthen democratic values and civic responsibility, address critical societal issues, and contribute to the public good. Wow! <laughs> I mean, if you really spend some time thinking about that as a goal, that's a pretty big deal. Okay, so I share this uh, definition sort of as a context because when I think about community engagement, this is what I think about. Carnegie defines it for me and for Western Carolina University. So we're going to start with community as our first audience, and this is a picture out of beautiful Dillsboro, North Carolina. Has anybody been to Dillsboro? Okay. Oh, you have! Fantastic! Excellent! I want to talk with you later. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So this is a very small community, and uh, it's about a square, of, a mile square long. It is a arts and crafts destination. There are many merchants who provide pottery and uh, hand-woven items and uh, beautiful artwork, and so it is an arts and crafts destination, a tourist destination. <coughs> this is a scene from their annual holiday uh, festival called the Dillsboro Lights and Luminaries, and that's going to be important because I'm going to share some examples of the work that the public relations students have done to really shore up and uh, help that uh, festival succeed. So, uh, with that sort of as a context, let's think about potential benefits for the community. And now, these certainly are not all of the benefits that are out there uh, for community members, but these are ones that are pretty commonly identified in the literature as, as uh, important for community members to think about. So one, or the first one is, valuable human resources to achieve community goals. One of the things that universities can make available to towns and cities, community partners, are those resources and those humans who have expertise in order to do things. So the availability of those human resources that these community partners would not otherwise have access to. So that access to university individuals. The second one is important for Dillsboro, and you will we'll learn uh, why in a moment. But this idea of new energy, new enthusiasm, and a new perspective applied to community work. Capacity building. So one of the things that we want to happen when we go in to a community is to help them help themselves. We don't want to be in a position of doing work for them, although we certainly will do that, perhaps even initially. But our end goal would be to help those community partners develop the capacity to grow and to do, to be self-sustaining. So capacity building, really, really important. And you will see in the Dillsboro example uh, how important that is. Community development, economic development, 
is a huge aspect of community engagement. And then the enhanced community university relationships or the town gown relationships is also incredibly important. So sort of from a macro organizational level. And so I'm gonna provide examples of each of these. So a little bit about the Dulesboro North Carolina partnership. In 2009, the leaders of Dulesboro contacted then Chancellor John Bardo and asked for help. Why? Because Dillsboro had experienced a double whammy, a perfect storm. The Great Smoky Mountains Railroad, which was a huge tourist attraction, moved its headquarters to neighboring Bryson City. That was devastating because the train had brought approximately 60,000 people annually into the town. And so Dillsboro didn't really have to do anything to market or advertise itself because it had this steady stream of people coming in every year. So the merchants were incredibly dependent on that train foot traffic. That went away, just as the Great Recession of 2008 hit. And as you know, tourism dollars nationwide shrank. People were scared to spend money, so they weren't going to come and spend money on artwork and pottery, right? So it was a, it was a, a really, really desperate situation. In fact, it was described as dismal. Businesses closed their doors. Businesses that had been in business for years shut their doors. Those that remained really struggled. I'm sorry to report that those pictures of the for sale and the for rent signs are actual pictures of Dillsboro businesses. And I'm even sorrier to say that those were not all of the for sale and for rent signs in that community. So it was a really, really difficult situation. So uh, then Chancellor uh, Bardo uh, decided that he, he was going to bring a group of people together to try to address the situation, to try to help this town. And he actually called this a moral duty, that the university had a moral duty a moral responsibility to try to help this little town that was only seven miles down the road. It was our neighbor. It was in our backyard. You can't look the other way. So he, um, I, I made the mistake of after one of our uh, meetings of saying to Dr. Bardo, if there's anything I can do to help, let me know. <laughs> you know what's coming next. The next morning he called and said, will you lead it? So of course I said yes, right? Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a great experience. So the overall goal is to help the town of Dillsboro survive, first and foremost, and hopefully to revive, right? So a revitalization, economic revital revitalization overall goal. The overall community relations goal was to really strengthen that relationship between WCU and Dillsboro. And then the overall community engagement goal is to match the resources and the expertise of WCU with Dillsboro's challenges and opportunities. So that's sort of the macro level of what we were trying to do. So some of the highlights of this five-year partnership. It was a university-wide effort. So we had dozens of faculty. We had hundreds of students contributing thousands of hours to this little town. I mean, we went in full strength to try to help the town of Dillsboro. And we had numerous successes. I'm going to highlight just a few here. Uh, there was substantial public relations and marketing support. Surprise, surprise. The uh, leader of the effort is a PR person, so guess what you get when your leader is a PR, a PR person. And they needed it, okay? They really needed it. And support for special events, especially lights and luminaries, and I'll provide some specific examples of this in just a few moments. Uh, Steve Hall uh, and some students did an economic impact study of the train 
discovering that the economic impact for Jackson County was $26 million annually. And so we tried to develop a campaign to get the Jackson County commissioners to provide about a half million dollars in funding to bring the train back because the train was willing to do so with some economic incentives. I'm sorry to say that that campaign failed. Okay. Uh, we also encourage them to take advantage of the Small Business and Technology Development Center on our campus. And uh, we developed a business plan competition in cooperation with the local community college, Southwestern Community College, which does a, a tremendous job in training for small businesses. So that was a great collaboration between the local community college and Western Carolina University. And that resulted in uh, several uh, applications for the business plan and the winner getting $5,000 for a new uh, uh, startup or expansion of their business in Dillsboro. So really, really uh, specific measurable kinds of activities. And uh, probably the most fun one that I had the opportunity to work uh, on is the development of an app for a mobile website for Dillsboro. So this is like 2011, so we are way ahead of our time, right, in rural North Carolina. Maybe not for you, Jeremy, but okay. For, for Dillsboro, North Carolina, it was way ahead of its time uh, to have a, a mobile website. That's probably the most um, fun I've had doing an interdisciplinary uh, project because it involved our computer information uh, systems, students, our theater and uh, costume people, and we can talk a little bit more about how they got involved in a few moments if you wish, okay, so and more. So those are some of the things that we did. So uh, just a few sample objectives. We talked about some goals earlier. I think it's really important that when you are doing uh, any type of external work, community engagement, that you, in cooperation with your community partner, set very specific objectives. And there's a couple of reasons. First, it really aids evaluation. And you've got a target, right? So you know exactly what you are trying to accomplish. And at the end of that, you can look back and it's pretty easy to determine whether or not you've done it. But from a, uh, a community engagement management perspective, one of the reasons really to do that is you want to manage expectations because you don't want your community partner, in this case Dillsboro, thinking that somehow Western was going to save them, right? Nor do you want them to think that we are going to do anything. So to be able to clarify those objectives, make it very specific, it helps everybody to be on the same page. And so I think that's a, if that's a, that's one of the takeaways that I would certainly, certainly stress. So here are just a few of them. To increase the number of faculty, staff, students, and locals, families who visit Dillsboro for special events. And we developed this objective because we no longer had the tourist attraction. People were as much. Now certainly tourists are still coming to Dillsboro. But without the train, the attraction for tourists was not as great as it had been. And so we tried to focus on drawing in more locals and more families and more WCU folks coming to Dillsboro. So we really shifted our focus in terms of the audiences or the demographics that we were targeting. Uh, we wanted them to visit for special events and then we wanted them to shop, right? So a, a pure economic development objective. And then we talked about the Small Business and Technology Development Center. So we set a goal of having at least half of those merchants, and we achieved that goal and more, at least half of those merchants to take advantage of those services. And then another fun one to increase the number of Dillsboro merchants using social media to promote their businesses. Again, this originated in 2009. So rural North Carolina, small mom and pop businesses, uh, the town didn't have a Facebook page, so very, very few of the businesses at that time had a social media presence. So that was a real opportunity for us uh, in communication, especially to be able to help the businesses in, in, uh, in that area. So uh, here is an example of some of the work that we did in the public relations campaigns class. Over several years, 
we tried to shore up this Lights and Luminaries Festival. And I think before I talk too much more about it, I'm just going to go ahead and show you the video. It's a one minute student produced video. And I think that will really just give you the flavor of Lights and Luminaries and then I'll give you a little bit more specifics. Experience the spirit and the splendor of Dillsboro's Lights and Luminaries Festival. Every year, this historic village is aglow with over 2,500 candles and thousands of white lights. Shoppers browse the quality arts and crafts and unique merchandise for just the right gift. Musicians and singers fill the air with holiday music, and children share their wishes with Santa and Mrs. Claus. Saturdays in December, Lights and Luminaries is Stillsboro's merchant's way of saying thank you to their customers. Okay, so that really gives you a sense of the town and also the kind of work that we were doing. So the PR students were totally involved in developing the programming for the uh, festivals as well as promoting it and getting people there. Uh, one team, and, and we, we did this over four years and still ongoing, one team was able to secure grant funding from our uh, student center to bring an iceless ice skating rink to Dillsboro. And th I think that was about $5,000. And the night was the opening night, so we called it college night at the Dillsboro Lights and Luminaries. And we were so scared that no one was going to show up because it was raining and wind gusts of up to 60 miles an hour. And all of this work, all of this money, we had to move the, the ice, ice skating rink into the train depot. We, we had planned to have it outside. So, Anybody do special events in here? So you, you know the nightmare that I'm, I'm talking about right, right now. But students were up to the challenge. We ended up with about 1,000 people uh, at that. From an economic standpoint, the sales from the merchants on that night had, had doubled from the previous year. So a real economic impact. And um, in 2013, that 1,000 people had attended. And I'm going to talk just a little bit more about the success of 2013 in just a moment. So how do we measure this? So these are the things that we've done to help <coughs> Dillsboro. How do we know whether or not we have benefited this community? And the research suggests the best practices is you go talk to the community members, right? What a concept. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter. I, well, maybe it matters a little bit what Betty Carter and Western Carolina University think about the success of the Dillsboro Project. What really matters is what do the community members think in terms of those benefits. So the uh, research method we chose was focus groups. We uh, contacted, and I, and I did not participate in this, uh, um, Lane Perry and a couple of his graduate students coordinated this. It would not be appropriate for me to be at the table because I had worked so closely with the merchants and the leaders. So two one and one half hour focus groups, they recorded them, the transcripts uh, were uh, transcribed verbatim, and then they were analyzed for themes. Surprise, surprise. Those benefits that we had talked about previously that may accrue to the community partners were clearly evident. And so I have quotes from the community members to illustrate those things. So before I do that, though, this is sort of context of a comment from a community member that says, this is where we started, right? That this person just knew the town was over. We were trying to figure out how we were going to survive. It was just to that point. Everybody's ego and confidence was down, and we felt isolated. Okay. So one of the benefits, this idea of new energy and perspectives, that a university can help in that area. So here are some quotes from that focus group. Dillsboro was fragmented, and WC came in and had the expertise and ideas to see the town as a whole. 
there was a lot of finger pointing and blame going on. And so to see the town as a whole, a breath of life. I have this uh, third quote in red because from my perspective, this is why the Dillsborough Project was successful. <coughs> It created a new mindset. We pulled together with WCU, it pulled us together. So we really did bond. <laughs> I would consider many of the Dillsboro merchants personal friends now after five years of really working closely together. So it brought us together. We have leadership now. And then this last one, biggest, best things that came out was the unity among the merchants. Right, as a result of the town coming in to try to pull everybody together, the merchants really came together. And so for the first time, there was this camaraderie among the merchants. We're going to work this together with WCU. It was tremendous. Okay. The next benefit in terms of building capacity. So one of the focus group members said, when WC reaches a point that says, okay, the university-wide partnership with Dillsboro is no more, and that happened in 2014, that hopefully the community is left in a better position to help itself. And so this quote really reflects that, that they have left us the building blocks. The mayor termed it in terms of a foundation on which to build. And I love this last quote. We at one time before the project, we're known as the town of no. Our capacity has increased specifically, and we have gone from no to maybe and sometimes yes. So sort of a transformation in terms of their attitude and their mindset. Uh, economic development, many, and this is just a sampling, many of the merchants indicated that they benefited tremendously from WCU faculty, staff, and students frequenting their businesses and making purchases in ways that they had not done before. And this last line here, that's what we as a town need to survive is more local business. So that economic impact. Uh, this is probably my favorite slide of the entire presentation. This is the beautiful Jared House. It's a historic uh, inn and restaurant. It's on the National Register of Historic Places and they were really struggling. An international investor bought the Jared House. And this is a person who has holding similar kinds of lodging establishments, historical lodging establishments, both in the Southeast and around the world. And that was really a turning point. When this happened in 2014, I felt like Dillsborough was turning the quarter, corner because, as this quote summarizes, people are viewing Dillsborough as a place to reinvest, and that's what WCU has done for us. So I had the um, pleasure of writing the news release announcing the sale. It's the best news release I've ever written because I was so excited that this was happening for the Jared House, the Hart Barters, as well as uh, for this town. And then the economic benefit of lights and luminaries led the festival to unprecedented growth, resulting in several merchants reporting December 6, 2013, which was college night. It's the night that we brought the iceless ice skating rink to Dillsboro as the most successful day of sales since the economic downturn. So a very measurable outcome for them. In terms of the town-gown relationship, we have a, a couple of different perspectives. This first perspective is more of an extreme uh, perspective. I don't know that that was widely shared among the people of Dillsboro, but it's certainly a perspective worth reporting. And that is that we were a non-entity, we being the university, until they got involved with us, right? That we were just a college that was down the road seven miles. And then another person adds, seven miles down the road, but you think it was seven days. So really identifying that there was this gap, right, this gap between the community and the university. So that's an extreme perspective. I think these probably, these quotes are probably more representative of the <coughs> overall sentiment uh, in Dillsboro. 
that the relationship was not unfriendly. Not exactly a rousing endorsement, right? <laughs> not unfriendly, right? But now we're really close. Now we feel like we are a part of Western. Because of all that we've done over the last five years, the next person says, it's renewed our interest in WCU too. And here's this reciprocity, right? So not only has what Western has contributed to Dillsboro help Dillsboro, but wait a minute, Dillsboro is saying we're now more interested in what's going on at Western Carolina University, and we want to go up there and do things. So going up there, where is up there? Where is Western Carolina University? This is beautiful color we. We are situated between the Great Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge. And I know we have at least one gentleman who has been in Cullowee. I know we have somebody who's been in Dillsboro. Anybody else been in Western North Carolina or the Great Smoky Mountains? Okay, so just a couple. I thought we might have more than that since the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited park in the country. So uh, put it on your bucket list. It's a, great, <laughs> it's a great place to be. Now, I am not paid by the tourism department, so just in case you're, you're wondering, okay, genuine uh, uh, recommendation there for you. So let's talk about some of the university benefits. And I'm going to go through uh, the university benefits, the faculty and the student benefits much more quickly than uh, the time that I spent on community. So one of the things that we think about from an organizational perspective is whether or not the work we're doing is in alignment with the university's overall mission. So Western's mission is to serve the region of Western North Carolina, a regional comprehensive university. And what Carnegie Foundation looks for is whether or not the community engagement is institutionalized. Is it a part of the structure of the university? And that's something that you have to document in that Carnegie, Carnegie um, community engagement application. Uh, is it part of the culture? Is, as Lane Perry likes to say, is service and learning habituated? Is it something that you do out of habit? It's not something new, but it's routine for you, habituated or routinized. And so what are your commitments in terms of personnel and budgets and all of those kinds of things? Which can lead to national recognition for the Carnegie Foundation as well as the President's Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll. Western has received that seven uh, times. So the mission of, uh, sorry, the vision. The vision of Western Carolina University is to be recognized as a national leader in community engagement. So how do our activities in the community help us achieve that vision? Okay, so what are some of those benefits? Well, we want to we want to figure out what's going on, right? Who, which faculty, which students, which areas of the university are doing good work in community engagement, service learning? Uh, where where is it happening? Do we have a hot pocket of of uh, service learning in business or in the arts or wherever it is, and to what extent? So both the depth and the breadth of community community engagement. We want to know what's going on, and there's an increasing expectation for reporting those results. So we have a lot of national and statewide uh, agencies that want us to document these activities and document these outcomes. So both the, the reporting of the accomplishments and the activities. And, red, something good's coming, right? According to Leslie Boney, who is the Vice President for International Community Engagement and Economic Development, I think I got that right, for the University of North Carolina General Administration, so system-wide for the UNC um, system, says this about the Carnegie, Commu Carnegie Community Engagement application process. He says it's a tool for capturing and categorizing and quantifying current activity, red, as well as a tool that creates an inspiration for behavior change in the future. So a takeaway for you uh, for this area. The idea that we are measuring so that we know and that we, we report is important. But maybe the most important reason we measure and report 
is for aspirational reasons. So what can we do in the future? How can we use this data to improve our um, offerings, to improve our community engagement? So that aspirational aspect, I think, is really very important. So what are some of the benefits? Certainly increased awareness and enhanced reputation uh, shared with both internal and external audiences. Uh, is the person who submitted UNO's community engagement application in the room? Yes? No? Yes? Yeah, you help? Okay. Do you know how many pages your application was? How many? Okay, so I thought hours was long, okay? So 110 pages, and you had a couple of hundred pages? Wow, okay, that's great. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's not. Okay. So 110 page uh, application. So we, we learned a lot doing this application. We were able to document a lot of good work. But you can't distribute, well you could, but you shouldn't <laughs> distribute a 110 page paper or certainly not a 200 page report because nobody's going to read it. So we distilled the highlights into a 20-page publication. We distributed, distributed it online uh, to faculty. We posted it on the engagement website. And we distributed 500 print copies to some special uh, audiences, one being new faculty. And this was a very calculated move on our part because we talked about the idea of community engagement being institu institutionalized and that it being routinized and habituated. We certainly wanted new faculty to enter knowing the robustness of our community engagement activities. So new faculty, all new faculty got a hard copy of this. Board of Governors and Board of Trustees. And I don't think I'm going to have time to take you to the link, but there is the link and I'm going to uh, share this PowerPoint with Jeremy. He'll be able to post it on a OneDrive or wherever so you will all have access to that. Uh, another benefit, as we've talked about, is the, the improved town-gown relationships. This picture here is of David Belcher, Belcher and his wife Susan Belcher. But what's really important is that they are in a horse-drawn carriage uh, for Dillsborough Lights and Luminaries with the mayor uh, here, uh, uh, Mike Fitzgerald, and his wife Kathy, and then other merchants and council members there. So very, very close together. This uh, on the side here is a picture of the app launch party, and I think I've got time to just show you really quickly uh, what that was like. So let me, let me just go ahead and do that. Uh, this is also a student-produced video. It was so much fun, and I think you'll see the fun uh, in that video. It was a full house at the Jarrett House yesterday as the communities of Dillsboro, Silva, and WCU witnessed the launch of the Dillsboro mobile web app. Fist pumps from Chancellor Belcher, standing ovations from the crowd, and a dancing pause launched the new app with excitement as Dillsboro took its first steps into the mobile world. As part of the Chancellor's installation week, Chancellor Belcher and his wife Susan were the first to scan the mobile man to access the app. Dr. Betty Farmer, a communication professor and head of the Dillsborough Project, was pleased with the turnout and ecstatic with the success of the students involved. Guests enjoyed free appetizers and Purple Pride Punch to celebrate the success of the launch Dillsboro campaign. So you can see that's fun. And the narrator did not pronounce appetizers the way that he should have, because it was app. <laughs> and, and yes, I'm wearing my purple. I'm flying the colors today. Okay, all, all, all planned, of course. I'd love to talk more about the Dillsboro uh, mobile web app, app uh, once we get to the Q&A, if you would uh, be interested in doing that. So now we're transitioning to faculty. Two, two more audiences. We're going to go through these uh, fair, fairly quickly. I'm doing okay on time, Jeremy. Okay, yeah? All right, good. So this is a picture of Dan Clapper. He's a computer information sciences faculty member. 
who, with the help of his students, created the Dillsboro mobile web app, as well as many other applications for a wide variety of community partners. So what are some of the benefits for faculty? What are those mutually beneficial outcomes as a result of working in community engagement and service learning? Uh, there is a great deal of satisfaction from putting students out in the real world. There's also a lot of satisfaction from helping community partners achieve those goals. Uh, sometimes I, I think that faculty members who do a lot of service learning and community engagement are kind of do-gooders, right? They, they, they want to help people and they, they want to achieve these kinds of results because they personally get a great amount of satisfaction from that. Uh, what I'm going to focus on in terms of a measurement example is the scholarly productivity related to community engagement and the support for professional development related to CE. So we developed a community-based activities faculty survey in 2013. And we were developing it prior to the publication of this article from Waters and Lane, which concluded that the measurement of professional development and impact influence of scholarship was not found in their review of 121 campus compact. Familiar with campus compact? Okay, every state, not every state, but most states uh, have those. Uh, in their review of 121 campus compact institutions. And what's significant about that is if you are a member of Campus Compact, then you likely are doing a lot of engagement activity. So these are sort of the cream of the crop in terms of institutions. So if these institutions are not measuring uh, productivity related to community engagement for their faculty, then I'm not sure anybody else would be, would be doing that. So we really saw that as a research uh, area for a uh, research opportunity. So we developed the WCU Community-Based Activity Survey for faculty uh, in 2013. It continues. This was the first evidence-based survey of WCU faculty to measure the amount of community engagement and service learning. And it was incredibly revealing. Uh, in terms of the, the breadth and the depth of community engagement and service learning occurring across uh, campuses. So we identified multiple successes, including those professional benefits to faculty. Uh, here are the questions. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that because I also have a link uh, to the <coughs> survey that you can look at. Okay. So I'm going to focus here on the results for the professional development for faculty particularly related to scholarly productivity. So a sample research question was, please provide citations, right? Citations for any scholarly productivity connected to your community-based activities. So we aren't saying, tell us the project that you're working on. Tell us the citation for your presentation, your book, or your article. Okay? So that's, that's a significant outcome. Right? And here's what we found. Uh, nearly two-thirds of WCU faculty in 2013 reported scholarly productivity related to community-engaged activities within their courses. Okay, so that's a pretty high bar. Uh, we have about 600 faculty at Western, and so that N was 291, so that's about a 50% response rate. And I just saw somebody say, wow, yeah, that's a pretty good response rate. <coughs> and one of the challenges in doing faculty surveys is to get the faculty <laughs> to complete the dang survey, right? So a, a great, a great response rate. And then here are some of the specifics that we found. Again, I'm not going to go through that. But suffice it to say that we were so pleased with the results that we found in terms of the professional development and the scholarly activity uh, for WCU faculty. And the significance of that from a PR perspective was that it really provided great uh, data for storytelling and also it allowed us to develop what we are calling a STAR program where we can um, highlight the work of these exemplary faculty. Uh, so about five faculty each year uh, based on the survey uh, information that they provide 
are selected for the STAR program. There's a little bit of a monet monetary award and public recognition. Okay. Uh, for more information, we were recently published in Metropolitan University Journal, and there's the link to that. Okay, so our final segment here is students, and that's certainly students in the room. Uh, it's, it's certainly not the least, right? So maybe the most or one of the most important audiences here. Uh, does anybody know who the woman in the center of that picture is? Anybody know? Do we have any PR people here who are in PRSSA? Anybody recognize? <coughs> Anybody ever heard of Lauren Gray? Yes, okay, so PRSSA national president a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a picture of Lauren providing one-on-one -on -one instruction with Dillsboro merchants for social media training. Uh, so what are some of the benefits for students and alumni, and the alumni part is going to be really uh, key here in just a moment. Certainly the academic learning outcomes, the professional and the career development, they're developing those skills that they're going to need and use in the real world, uh, personal growth in terms of values, and this idea of citizenship and social responsibility, especially post-graduation. One of the things we know about the literature is that the benefits for students for community engagement and service learning are well documented while, they're, while they are students. But we have less documentation about what happens after they graduate. And it makes sense why we don't know as much about uh, graduates' social responsibility and citizenship after, after they leave the university because we no longer have instant contact uh, with them. So being able to identify alumni addresses and be able to make that connection is a real challenge to be able to measure whether or not those values that we hope we are nurturing uh, really stick post-graduation. So that was the focus for a, a research project that Steve Hall, Lane Perry, and I did. We were looking at public relations students who had completed the PR campaigns class. How many of you have done a PR campaigns class? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Okay, so we replicated Werder and Strand's research, and basically Werder and Strand were looking at whether or not service learning was a predictor of course effectiveness, and also looking at the perceptions of uh, student outcomes. So what did they feel they learned as a result of doing service learning in the public relations campaigns class? So did they develop professional skills? Did they develop interpersonal skills and group skills and those kinds of things? Uh, sh they also found support for this instrument that they had developed, but they found weak support for the social responsibility items. And so that was kind of an aha moment for me in terms of I definitely want to find out what's going on there. So in our research, we extended it to alumni. So we wanted to see what people who had graduated from the PR program were thinking about the value of their community engagement and service learning experience post-graduation. We also included some open-ended open questions about citizenship and responsibility. So surveyed our graduates. Uh, communication and PR is designated as a leading light program at WCU. We've earned that designation from the Center for Service and Learning uh, two times. And we looked at students who had been in the class for, uh, I'm sorry, had, who had taken the class over a five-year period, okay? Uh, did, it in, uh, did the survey in 2013. And without going into details, we can uh, share that the quantitative results suggest that the goals of service learning were realized and that uh, validates or supports Werner and Strand's research and it confirmed the use of that instrument. And the qualitative research, different than Werner and Strand's, suggests that the goals of citizenship and social responsibility stuck post-graduation. And this is a link that I'll provide to the International Association for Research and Service Learning and Community Engagement uh, presentation. Isn't that a great one? Are you a, I should get an award for being able to say that, right? <laughs> uh, a presentation that we did in Boston 2015. So here are just a couple of themes. I'm almost finished. A couple of themes emerging from the students' responses. Uh, the first is that they developed a genuine sense of caring as a result of working in Dillsboro. 
that they no longer felt as though this was just a class project, but they really bought in, that they really began to care about the success of their project and care about the success of that community. Another theme is the idea that as a result of working in Dillsboro, they've developed this lifelong habit of community involvement. That as a result of the time they spent in that little town, they continue to volunteer as a result of that. So the direct connection. And then the final one, the value of PR to make a difference. And I love these two. Uh, the idea that if students have particular skills and tools, that they can put them to work to better our communities. And then the final one, and if we've got journalism people in here, Jeremy, you might be interested in this one, but the PR industry is well known for its spin on the truth. So creating a new generation of socially responsible PR workers can shape our industry into a better one. So this brings me back to our opening definition of the Carnegie Foundation and what the goal of community engagement is all about. So if we can document that somehow students' work and community engagement and service learning is somehow contributing to the public good, uh, that's a success. I think we've also provided examples of students and faculty benefiting professionally as a result of their work in community engagement. And so I hope that I've provided some examples here that we are fulfilling the <coughs> aspirational goal of the Carnegie definition in terms of mutually beneficial relationships and reciprocity. Thank you. I'll take questions.